Hey, everybody. How's it going? My name is Traveler Charlie. I'm a non-binary Latinx money coach and business wizard helping LGBT and BIPOC folks and entrepreneurs make money there, bitch. And today I wanted to share with you a presentation that I just did for my drug use and societal consequences elective class of my MBA. So I'm getting a social impact MBA from the Heller School at Brandeis University in the Boston area. I've been studying fully remotely. It's been a pretty intense 16 month full-time program. And I'm finally finishing my degree in December, 2021, let's go. And so in my social entrepreneurship concentration, I was allowed to take a few electives. Last year I took assets and social policy because you know, I'm all about eliminating the generational wealth gap more hands in the folks of marginalized people, more money in their hands. But with this final semester, I said, let me step out of my comfort zone and learn about something I don't know much about. I've always heard things about the opioid, opioid crisis, marijuana legalization. And in Mexico, I was finally able to experiment and explore magic mushrooms, psilocybin. And I've been learning a lot about that. So I decided to take this class and learn more about drug use in destigmatizing ways. So for my final presentation and paper, I wanted to talk about psilocybin, the history and promising treatment for substance use disorder. And I wanted to share this presentation with all of you today. So I'm trying to skip to the next slide, perfect. So just as an overview, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation, just, just give you a brief introduction, then I'm going to talk about trauma and substance use disorder, then talk about the historical use of psilocybin, which is a compound found in magic mushrooms in Mesoamerica. Then I'm going to talk about US imperialism and the discovery of psychedelics and how they were brought to the US. Then I'm going to talk about uses of the psilocybin in addiction treatment. And I'm going to talk about critiques of psychedelic exceptionalism and what the heck that all means. And then I'll end with my personal experience with mushrooms, along with words of caution that are very necessary because mushrooms are extremely powerful. And I'm here to share the lessons that they've taught me with you today. So with the recent decriminalization of psilocybin in cities in the US like Denver, Santa Cruz and Oakland, you might think there's been a recent discovery of the benefits of psychedelics for the human mind. This is untrue as of various cultures around the world have taken psychedelics for thousands of years. Researchers in the US began exploring how psychedelics not only expand the human mind, but they also help us deal with trauma and addiction. And this research began in the US as early as the 1950s. Like I said, I'll focus mostly on psilocybin, a compound found in magic mushrooms. So before we talk about addiction, substance use, all of that jazz, one of the biggest takeaways I got from this class was that you cannot talk about addiction without talking about trauma. I included this graph here from somebody who presented in my class that just illustrates the striking correlation between trauma and substance use disorder and addiction. According to an adverse childhood experience, ACE survey, for each noted adversity that somebody experienced, like it was childhood neglect, emotional, physical abuse, you name it, the risk for early initiation of substance abuse increases two to four times. Far too many people have no other way out of coping with their trauma than continuing to use drugs and or alcohol to give them a sense of temporary relief. There's a striking dose response relationship to adverse childhood experiences and drug use. You can also go to the ACE website and you can take a quiz in which it will ask you about pretty triggering, just FYI, uh, adverse childhood experiences and it will give you an ACE score based off how traumatic your childhood is too. 
Um, it's really vital to understand the relationship between trauma and substance use disorder. And that's not something that we talk about enough, which is one thing I'm really grateful that I learned about in this class. This is relevant to me as a money and business coach because I help people heal their trauma. I help them heal their money trauma and we get really deep. But who am I to help others heal if I'm not trying to heal myself? And I've definitely um, slipped into alcohol, never alcoholism, but I've definitely had one too many drinks at a time. I smoke weed to numb my pain and feelings. The things a lot of us can relate. doesn't mean that we have to um, become addicts in order to relate to the fact that some of us are just in pain and we resort to substances to numb the pain, but it's just temporary. The hard work comes in the healing that happens when we're not using all of these harmful substances like alcohol, which is pretty bad for you. And this is not anything new. So like I said, who am I to help others heal if I'm not in the journey myself of healing myself? So that's why talking about trauma and mushrooms, you wouldn't think that a money coach would be doing this, but that's why I'm so passionate about this work. And I'm also a multi-dimensional human. I love mushrooms. I love talking about them and exploring them. And they've helped me unlock another creative side of me, the artistic side. They reminded me that I'm an artist and that I want to show my art with the world. So historical use in Mesoamerica. Hallucinogenic mushroom consumption dates as far back as 3,500 years in Mesoamerica. The Maya, Aztec, Totonac, Mazatec, Mixtec, and Aztecs consumed them for medicinal and religious purposes. Psilocybin was used in mystical ceremonies for these people to achieve greater spiritual connection with each other and with their divine powers. <laughs> the people of Teotenango venerated this plant medicine so much that they would grind mushrooms with water on models of temples that were to be built or on stones marked with petroglyphs. In present day Mexico and Central America, mushroom stones carved to represent hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic mushrooms have been found. I'm clearly so excited about this stuff, y'all. <laughs> Thousands of tourists visit Mexico for different psychedelic retreats in which they consume peyote, ayahuasca, and magic mushrooms in modern day ceremonies. And this is the part that I'm pretty critical about because people flock to this part of Mexico where I am, I'm in the Playa del Carmen near Cancun area. And there's just so many tourists who flock down here, who pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for these ceremonies, which are oftentimes led by white shamans who are not even from here, don't speak the local language and profit off of this historically, culturally significant practice. And then people go back and they're not even given the tools to integrate their experience because it's not just a one and done trip. The, the real trip has to happen, yes, before, during, and especially after the trip too, because not all of these trips are going to be super happy. And I'll get more into detail on um, why I'm such a strong believer in that people need to be informed before just using mushrooms as if they're just like a quick fix for trauma because they're not. And something that I noticed in this um, drug use and societal consequences class is that so many times we talk about drug use in a very US Western centric way as if the Americans are the ones consuming everything and Mexico's the one that's sending over the cocaine and all these Latin American countries are the problem. But as I'll tell you in the next slide, Americans have come down here and they've extracted these resources to the detriment of the local people, which is something that I feel like should be talked about much more in these kinds of classes. So on that note, let's take a trip back in history lane. In 1955, a wealthy, rich, white bank executive named R. Gordon Watson and his Russian wife came down to Mexico and met a local Mazatec shaman, Maria Sabina, who allegedly couldn't even speak Spanish because she spoke her local language in the state of Oaxaca, who introduced him to magic mushrooms during a ritual ceremony. Others say that he forced her to perform the ceremony to show him, which does not surprise me at all. 
Two years later, he published an account of his psychedelic experience in Life magazine in which he revealed the identities of the natives and the location of the ceremony, despite promising them that he wouldn't. Sounds like neocolonialism to me. Police accused Maria Sabina of sending drugs to foreigners, selling drugs to them, and locals became outraged at the influx in drug-seeking tourists because they read the article and the locals even burned down Maria Sabina's house. The awareness of psychedelics grew in the US at the expense of the Mazatec people. And this is just one group that was compromised. This is just one example, one case study. Can't imagine how many more people were impacted in this way that we might never even know about, but it's important to just talk about these things. Once American psychiatrists, scientists, and mental health professionals became aware of psilocybin, they began studies to explore treatments for psychiatric diagnoses like alcoholism and depression. Other people took them recreationally for mental and emotional exploration. Researchers only had a few years to research the therapeutic effects of psychedelic mushrooms until the government cracked down. In 1968, Nixon declared drugs to be public enemy number one and declared the war on drugs. Later, aides of his admitted that this was racist as well as to undermine anti-Vietnam War efforts. Why would Nixon be happy with people taking psychedelics and expanding their own minds and being anti-capitalist and grateful and connecting with each other when he needed people to go fight this war and profit off the military industrial complex? So for him, it was a no-brainer. In 1970, the Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act was devised to create a scheduling system to classify drugs based on their medicinal use and potential for addiction, which declared both marijuana and heroin to be under the same umbrella as mushrooms of Schedule One, which is the most heavily criminalized category of drugs because they're considered to have a high potential for abuse and no currently accepted <laughs> medical use. And this remains unchanged at the federal level since 1970. Nixon's drug star approach was very militaristic and focused on criminalization rather than prevention and decriminalization. This approach is slowly changing, but many would argue that it's not changing fast enough. Another takeaway that I got from this class was that language absolutely matters. Notice how I said the name of the 1970 act it was called the Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act. I've learned to not use this word drug abuse because that puts the blame on the person abusing this drug. And so instead of calling it drug abuse, we call it substance use disorder. It's a disorder, people have trauma, they have things going on, mental health issues. And that is what causes them to resort to using substances too. So language matters. It's a huge takeaway. And now I'm more conscious of never saying drug abuse, substance use disorder. So on a happier note, barely in the year 2010, <laughs> very recently, scientists at Johns Hopkins were able to resuscitate the psychedelic research that was done in the 50s and 60s and started psilocybin therapy. And I wanna talk about how that is opening a new window, window into possible substance use disorder treatment. One Johns Hopkins pilot study done among tobacco smokers who use psilocybin in controlled environments showed that after six months, 80% of smokers in the pilot study had abstained from cigarettes for at least a week. As verified by breathalyzer and urine analysis, a vast improvement over other smoking cessation therapies whose efficacy rates are typically less than 35%. After 12 months, 67% of participants still weren't smoking and 60% remained abstinent after 16 months or more. Also, over 85% of the subjects rated their psilocybin trip as one of the most meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their lives. And definitely relate to that. The team is currently more than halfway through a larger five-year study of 80 people randomized to receive either psilocybin or a nicotine patch. 
The researchers at Johns Hopkins are also starting or planning studies using psilocybin therapy for a wide range of other conditions like opioid addiction, PTSD, anorexia, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, and alcoholism in people with depression. Oh, yes. From personal experience after my first experience with mushroom, I stopped drinking alcohol even more. When COVID hit, I realized that I probably should not be drinking two to three beers a night, but I was still drinking more frequently than after mushroom trips. I pretty much don't drink beer alone. Sometimes I'll say, wow, I've been at home and I haven't had a single bottle of alcohol in my fridge for like a week. And that's been a normal for me because the mushrooms really made me confront, why do you have to drink beer? Does it really make you happy? Are you just trying to numb your pain and get to the root of the problem instead of just numbing myself? But I still love the flavor of mojitos. I started drinking virgin mojitos, making these cute virgin cocktails. Uh, and, and if I go out with friends, I'll have one, two drink snacks and I get hangovers so much more easily. <laughs> so my tolerance for alcohol has also dropped significantly since starting with the, the mushrooms. Another thing I wanted to talk about that I didn't really know wasn't familiar with this term is the term of psychedelic exceptionalism. It's an ideology that claims that less harmful or less addictive drugs like weed, mushrooms, or ayahuasca are inherently better, safer, or more desirable for people to use than other drugs. This is dangerous when talking about decriminalization and destigmatizing drug use disorder because Raising drugs as good drugs puts drugs like heroin, alcohol, or crack cocaine, and they're treated as their contrast. So when it's taken to extremes, psychedelic exceptionalism will stigmatize not just some drugs, but the people who use them. So if we're privileging psychedelics and um, thinking that they should not be in the whole Schedule 1, Schedule 2, Schedule 3 scheme, we're leaving behind all of these harder more potent drugs and perpetuating the, perpetuating the idea that people who consume this hard drug should be in jail for this amount of time and this reason. And this just perpetuates the drug war too. Uh, Dr. Carl Hart, who talks about psychedelics said that ketamine is a derivative of PCP and PCP is a psychedelic, but it's one we disown in the community. We love ketamine for its therapeutic and recreational effects while we've been silent about the vilification of PCP. We're told PCP causes violence and agitation, which is simply not true, according to Hart, which I definitely recommend that you look into Carl Hart. He's a brilliant scientist and uh, I've, I've seen him speak too on some documentaries. I include this slide because before presenting on mushrooms, I said, oh, I'm going to study a good drug. <laughs> and then when I read about this, I said, I can't just have a binary of good drug and, and bad drug. I'm non-binary as it is. We're not about the good and the bad out here. It's all about exploring the nuances and the language behind how we talk about drugs, whether they're good or bad, and, and who is stigmatized too. So some words of caution, psilocybin and mushrooms, they're not a magical cure for trauma. Like any drug, psilocybin comes with risks. Folks with psychotic disorders like schizophrenia or who have a strong predisposition for them are generally advised against taking these hallucinogens. Folks that have uncontrolled hypertension are also encouraged to not take them since psilocybin can raise your blood pressure. It can also make you feel very hot and very cold all of a sudden. Even though it seems to be one of the safest recreational drugs and is not considered addictive, there have been reports associated with deaths, but these have been results of allegedly mixing them with multiple drugs, impure substances, or other underlying medical issues. In the smoking study I had mentioned, a third of the participants felt some form of anxiety at a high dose of psilocybin. These risks can be minimized by carefully, carefully choosing participants administering the drug 
in a controlled environment. So your mental mindset matters and your setting matters too. You should not be taking psilocybin in a busy party, busy intersection, because it, at least from personal experience, I'm a sensitive person and it just amplifies that by 10 or 20%. And so I, I have not enjoyed taking them. I took micro dose at the beach once and I loved how I felt in the water. I felt super connected with the ocean and mother nature. But then as soon as I sat on the beach, I just felt like I could hear all of the people and felt their energy and I had to go. <laughs> And set definitely matters. Your mindset matters too. It's important to have an intention and start off small. My first uh, experience was in April and I was still on a low dose of an antidepressant. I've been on antidepressants since 2017 and I was on sertraline and I was taking half the pill. So it was on a 0.25 milligram dose, I believe every day. And I had tried uh, stopping cold turkey a year ago, November of 2020, when I moved to Mexico for good, but I only lasted a week before feeling incredibly down and, and depressed. And I said, okay, it's not the time. Maybe I can try later. And so uh, in, in April of 2021, I microdosed. Poco a poco. I had a little bit at a time too, because weed makes me paranoid. I'm very sensitive. The only drugs I've consumed are caffeine alcohol, <laughs> small doses of tobacco, marijuana, and psilocybin. That's it. So my first trip, I was microdosing a little bit and I said, hmm, let me see how I feel. I, and it takes about 30, 40 minutes for your system to process it. And I was on a low dose too, because I was skeptical, but the mushrooms helped me give myself a window in time of five hours of saying, oh, this is what it feels like to exist without anxiety. This is amazing. I can just exist and not worry about anything. And so I feel like that's what mushrooms did for me. They helped unlock the possibilities that have been laying dormant within myself, but have been suppressed because of society, they suppressed because of my traumas, but they reminded me that I have the potential within myself to be my own medicine without depending on other substances like alcohol, caffeine, mushrooms. I still can't not drink coffee in the morning. I love it for my routine, um, but yes, <laughs> that's the one drug I do consume every day. And I'm calling it a drug just to normalize that. A lot of us probably drink coffee too. And just to normalize that, probably all of us do drugs. It's a substance that we feel like we have to depend on in order to function. And a lot of people feel that way about caffeine, myself included. So. And I don't feel like it's as bad for my health and my liver as drinking alcohol. Have I done all the research? No, <laughs> but that's how I feel for now. Anyway, back to this. So yeah, after just microdosing, I didn't really have any super huge grand epiphanies or anything like that. I stopped drinking as much alcohol and then I was able to stop my antidepressants cold turkey because I was reminded that I have the possibility within myself to not take antidepressants. This is not to say that you should all stop using antidepressants. You need to, to use what works for you too. I had tried time and time again and failed. And by this time I was able to stop them because I didn't want to keep paying for antidepressants for this pill that was numbing me. Uh, so I couldn't feel things. This, that was my personal choice. If you're on antidepressants, you might need to be on them and that's fine. I'm not here to, to tell people what they should do. This is just my personal experience and my choices with my body. That is mine. And then a few weeks after I had my first actual trip, which was about five milligrams, which is known as the, the typical um, dosage you need for a significant trip. And I was painting and then all of a sudden I felt like my dad was talking to me which scared me because as an LGBT person, I have issues with family estrangement. I haven't seen my parents in a combined amount of 15 years, which is hard, but the mushrooms reminded me that I still hadn't had that sense of closure with my dad, who my parents divorced when I was 14 and then he left to go back to Mexico. And um, yeah, I haven't seen him in like 10 years. But I had this amazing experience where I felt like we were just enjoying 
and painting and not fighting and not criticizing each other. It was just a very healthy experience. And in that way, I sought out closure. I remember having all these fancy acrylic paints and he had taught me to be very careful and precise with the paints and not waste anything. Growing up in a Latinx household, you can't waste anything, whether it's paint or food, nada. But he was like, I'm sorry for, um, for telling you to, to save everything, to be so careful. I was just scared. I want you to just grab all the paint and use all the paint. It's like grab this fancy acrylic paint and smothered the canvas with it. <laughs> it looked like shit. But in the moment, it just felt so healing to be able to feel like I was talking to him through the paint. And it's powerful. I was crying the entire time. There was much snot coming out. I was just releasing and letting go. And it was hard, but luckily I had listened to several podcasts about these types of experiences because the mushrooms, they take your brain and they, they allow different parts of your brain that don't normally speak to each other to connect and interact and talk with each other. So that's why your vision can be distorted. I see a lot of wavy things like this painting I have here. I painted that on my last trip. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it makes you distort time too time feels like at least for me like it goes by much slower and then you question why does everybody have to go at such a rapid pace all the time and just do and produce and do things and then I realized wow capitalism really did not want us to take mushrooms because if we did we would just know that we had so much potential within ourselves to stop relying on substances to feel grateful, to connect with each other and to love each other. Capitalism doesn't want that. Capitalism wants us to feel like we need to buy things, buy alcohol to celebrate our wins, which I still love a good glass of wine or champagne to celebrate <laughs> my business wins, but to depend on these substances, that's what capitalism wants us to do because that puts more money in these businesses pockets. And that's why I think psychedelics are, are criminalized too. But then I say words of caution because I went through a really hard breakup uh, in August of this year of 2021. And I said, okay, I, now I just need to go on a mushroom trip to uh, achieve closure in five hours and get over this and stop feeling so sad and figure out everything. And that trip kicked my ass. Those mushrooms, aka me and my ego, reminded me that I cannot seek closure in five hours from something that was very meaningful and hard for me to end. And that I had to find the closure and solution elsewhere. And I started having very suicidal thoughts. And I was given this choice of just kill yourself. That's what you should do. And I remember walking to the threshold of the door because I was presented with this option and then just literally walking away from the threshold of the door because I reminded myself that this was just a bad trip. It's trying to teach me something. I feel like life gives us only a binary of a few options, but in that trip, it reminded me that, no, I have the option of saying no. I have the option of choosing my own path. And even though life is hard, I can still walk away from from, from suicide, honestly. And then luckily I have a therapist who was able to help me integrate this horrible trip. She said, I want you to draw out in a mandala all the things you saw and processed and the words you said to yourself, the negative self-talk, the imposter syndrome, the thoughts of, oh, people only want to work with you because they feel sorry for you. All my worst nightmares. The, you're only going to be alone. You always run away from people. Your family doesn't love you. Uh, you should go back to your ex, all those negative thoughts. And she said, okay, we're going to, we're going to integrate this. And also don't take what you're telling yourself during this trip seriously. The suicidal thoughts are basically just the message that you're feeling energetically low, it's not to kill yourself. And, and I feel like in a way I'm still processing all of those trips by just talking about these experiences and sharing with you with them. I'm a very open person. It's important for us to see the complexity of this plant medicine as not just a, 
a magical cure for trauma because it's so much more deep than that. If you're going to do this, you need to understand that your experiences can either be good or bad, and you won't always have control in how they go, but you will always have control in what you can learn from them, knowing that this trip will end. And what happens in the trip is not as important as how you process it after the trip. So that's a huge takeaway. Do I think mushrooms should be legalized? I think they should just be decriminalized because as soon as they're legalized, then that opens a window for some sort of industry to come in and just profit and market and expose people to these substances who might not even have the support that I did and that I intentionally set up for myself, like a therapist who was okay talking about <laughs> mushrooms, who had experience with them and could help me integrate my experience better. This class also taught me that just because the government is legalizing marijuana doesn't mean it's safe for you. I was reading articles in this class about how teenagers saw that, okay, weed is legal now. I'm going to go smoke a ton of weed. And some people would develop early onset schizophrenia, psychosis, and mental health issues too. And that's not okay. I'm more on the, just don't stick people in jail for using these substances. But as soon as it gets into this legalization, commercialization, that can be a slippery slope. Just because the government says it's legal doesn't mean it's 100% okay for everybody. And so that's why I wanted to share my experience to expose the complexity and the beauty of the mushrooms because that they're just a reflection of, of us, of our souls, but they help, help remind ourselves of our possibilities, of our power, and of our beautiful ability to go on these trips and continue going on them as we're processing them afterward. So I hope you've really enjoyed this presentation. It was really fun for me to, to talk about um, psilocybin mushrooms and to share with you uh, my, one of my last presentations of my master's in business, business administration program at the Heller School. And yeah, if you want to chat, Find me at travelercharlie.com. I have a long-term one-on-one private coaching program for LGBT, BIPOC entrepreneurs who want to make money their bitch. So have a great day, everybody.